Good evening, everybody. Uh, you're very welcome to this evening service, a very special service, a service to mark the centenary of the opening of the Northern Ireland Parliament. And it's not uh, every time uh, that you will have the opportunity to come and, and have this. I don't think any of us will be around for the next 100 years, but who knows what will happen uh, indeed in the future. So it's just lovely to see uh, so many gathered in here and then also joining uh, with us online. We have a number of people uh, watching as well. Uh, technology is a wonderful thing when it works, so hopefully everything goes to plan tonight. The liturgy for the service will all be on screen, so there are a number of prayers and bidding. If you're not familiar with uh, uh, this style of worship, I will guide you through it. Uh, the little bits that you will reply are in yellow, so hopefully that will be on the screen in a moment. Uh, and I want to thank a colleague of mine, uh, Reverend uh, Dr. Stanley Gamble, to give him his proper title. Stanley uh, put together this liturgy for this special service, and uh, the Church of Ireland have asked if we could, if we could do a, a service of uh, remembrance and indeed uh, to remember the formation of Northern Ireland and likewise it, because the Church of Ireland covers two jurisdictions there's a similar service uh, that's taking place probably in many churches throughout Ireland and, and, and throughout I, I don't know if I online you can call it the free state or whatever we used to call it but uh, that's taking place there to commemorate uh, their uh, coming into being as well. And so there's a little statement just to read out uh, before we begin with our greeting. Just to remind you that we are still under the regulations. It's lovely to see it's all spaced out. Face masks are to be worn at all times, unless of course you're reading from the front. Uh, it's lovely to see uh, Professor Walker here and, and, and Johnny Andrews here as well. Uh, they'll be sharing a few bits and pieces with us uh, during uh, this service. It's also a time for us to remember perhaps those who have lost their lives in the troubles here in Northern Ireland. And I'm not going to take away from our historians uh, as they speak to us, but it, it, it's important that we also remember that. Hence why, uh, you know, for me, it's quite, it's quite poignant in, in that 30 years of service in, in the police here in, in Northern Ireland. I lost a number of colleagues, so it, it's, just, uh, it's just nice to be able to be here to do this. So the statement goes, it says, this year marks the anniversary of the creation of Northern Ireland. It provides us with an opportunity to look back and reflect on the last 100 years and also to look forward in the present to the future that lies before us. The Government of Ireland Act 1920 came into force on the 3rd of May 1921, partitioning Ireland, creating Northern Ireland. The first election to the Northern Ireland Parliament took place later that month and on the 22nd of June 1921 the new Parliament was formally opened by King George V at Belfast City Hall. In his speech the King called for all Irishmen to pause, to stretch out the hand of forbearance and conciliation, to forgive and forget and to join in making for the land which they love, a new era of peace, contentment and goodwill. Sadly, this call was left unheeded by some sections of society at various points in the last 100 years, with tragic episodes of conflict, discontentment and ill will. Thankfully, good has prevailed over evil, with a new era emerging in recent times and a fresh commitment to peace, prosperity and power, sharing in better relations between North and South, East and West. Indeed, the focus of this service is on good governance and civic responsibility. The prayers of repentance encourage us to learn from the mistakes of the past, individual and corporate. As Her Majesty the Queen said in her speech in Dublin 10 years ago, with the benefit of historical hindsight, we can all see things which we would wish had been done differently or not at all. The prayers of thanksgiving invite us to give thanks for all that has been good and true over the past 100 years, 
and the prayers of intercession remind us of our various needs and the needs of others as well as our continued dependence on God to help and succor. And so welcome in the name of Christ. God's mercy and peace be with you. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Let us pray. Almighty God, you call us into a common fellowship of solidarity and love as we remember the foundation of Northern Ireland 100 years ago and reflect on the hopes and disappointments of the past century. Draw near to us and move us to work for peace and justice in the world around us. In the name of whom, of him who is Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We are uh, going to sing a couple of hymns tonight and then at the end of the service we will join together in the national anthem. And uh, these hymns have been chosen specifically. Uh, the, the first hymn, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, is a very familiar hymn uh, for all of us as we go forward in this land. And then the last song is In Christ Alone. It's a newer hymn, but it's written by a couple from Northern Ireland. And so we've been encouraged just to use slightly different songs and hymns throughout uh, this service of commemoration. So we're going to stand together and sing hymn 549. The words will be on the screen. Dear Lord and Father of mankind. share of the sins and shortcomings of the world, its pride, its selfishness, its greed, its evil divisions and hatreds. Let us confess our share in what is wrong and our failure to seek 
and establish that peace with God wills for his children. And so we pray together, most merciful God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned in thought and word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbour as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And Almighty God, you forgive all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep us in everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, the collect uh, for uh, this service, let us pray. God of our past and God of our future, from whom all authority comes, on this centenary of the opening of the Northern Ireland Parliament, we pray for the Legislative Assembly and its Executive. By your gracious help, may it give Northern Ireland good governance, serve with integrity and seek the common good, that all people may live peaceably and grow in respect for one another. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Professor Walker. I'm very pleased to be speaking here this evening. Now, can I be heard? Yep. I'm very pleased to be speaking here this evening. My father preached from this pulpit many times. My father was a very popular preacher. His sermons were never longer than 10 minutes. <laughs> Recently, Sheila Press informed me about a former parishioner of his at Knockbreda Parish Church who told her, but my father told him to be sure to indicate if he went over 10 minutes. Now, I may go a little over 10 minutes, but if I'm too long, please do let me know. I'm going to speak briefly this evening on the establishment of Northern Ireland. Of course, it's not entirely clear what date we should commemorate. The Government of Ireland Act, which legislated for the new Northern Ireland, received royal approval on the 22nd of December 1920. The Act came into operation on the 4th of May, 1921. Then the new Parliament was instituted and a Prime Minister and other Ministers uh, appointed on the 8th of June, 1921. And finally, the Parliament was officially opened on the 22nd of June by King George. We will go with that symbolic, that important symbolic opening of Parliament 100 years ago this coming Tuesday. The occasion occurred in the last stages of what we may call the Decade of Centenaries. That period from 1912 to 1922, when very important events impacted on Ireland. In fact, the date 1912 came after nearly three decades of important development in Ireland, when politics reflected strong divisions between Unionists on the one hand, Unionists mostly based in the North, who wanted to maintain free union with Great Britain, and nationalists who wanted home rule. In 1912, Ulster Unionists signed the Ulster Covenant to oppose the Third Home Rule Bill. The Ulster Volunteer Force was formed, which led to nationalists forming the Irish National Volunteers. Talk now emerged of some form of partition. The outbreak of war, however, in September 1914, put the whole issue on the back burner. Large numbers, unionists and nationalists, then volunteered for the war effort. Here in our church, we can see clear evidence of the service and sacrifice of so many at this time. On the main church wall, you can see the memorial to the son and grandson of the rector, the Reverend George Mitchell, who died when the Lusitania was sunk on the 7th of May, 1915. In the porch, you'll see the memorial to the men and women of our parish who served and died in the service of the country. And usually uh, the names of the women who served are also on our memorial. 
Our secretary, Mark Douglas, has conducted very valuable research into the lives and deaths of these people. We have not forgotten them. When the war ended, the political situation had changed dramatically in Ireland. After the 1916 Dublin Rising, there was a rise in support for a more advanced form of Irish self-government. In 1918, Sinn Féin became the dominant nationalist party, and the following year saw the beginning of the War of Independence, or Anglo-Irish War, between the IRA and Crown forces. At Westminster, efforts to find a political solution resulted in the Government of Ireland Act, which partitioned Ireland into two political entities and laid out parliaments for each. Given the confrontation between unions and Sinn Féin nationalists, I believe there was no realistic alternative to partition in 1920. However, it's very interesting to note that at Westminster, when the Government of Ireland Act was debated, which established Northern Ireland, not a single Ulster Unionist MP voted for it. On the 3rd of November 1920, Sir Edward Carson, the Unionist leader, explained why. He said he'd been against Home Rule in 1912. They'd all been against Home Rule in 1912, and they were still against it. So he would not vote for it. But he would not vote against it. The Act did have advantages. It recognised the rights of Unionists in the North to self-government. He believed that people in Ulster were now ready for their own Parliament. So they welcomed the Act at the end of the day, although they didn't vote for it. Sinn Féin did not accept the Government of Ireland Act, and so only Northern Ireland, based on the six northeast counties of Ireland, came into existence. The Act came into operation on the 4th of May, and elections to the new Parliament were held on the 24th of May. The result was a large Unionist return of 40 MPs against 12 Sinn Féin and Nationalist MPs. On the 7th of June, the Parliament was formally constituted at an event in the Belfast City Hall. We sometimes think you know, the big day is the 22nd of June. Yes, that's correct. But a couple of weeks beforehand, it's the Parliament is formally constituted at an event in the Belfast City Hall, presided over by the Lord Lieutenant Viscount Fitzalan. On the 4th of February, Carson had stood down as leader and was succeeded by James, James Craig as head of the Unionists. On this occasion, on the 7th of June, Craig was nominated as Prime Minister and seven new government ministers were named, including John Miller Andrews, uh, whose grandson is with us here today. A few days later, there was a special church service in St Anne's Cathedral, Belfast. Uh, among those present were politicians, including Craig, and the four Church of Ireland bishops, whose dioceses were in the new state, as well as leading Presbyterian and Methodist clergy. The preacher was the Church of Ireland Archbishop of Armagh, Archbishop Darcy. He urged that regard be given to, and I quote, the welfare of all the people of this province, of every creed and class, of the minority as well as the majority, end of quote. He made it clear that although Ireland would now be partitioned politically, the Church of Ireland would remain an all-Ireland institution. And that, of course, is true about all the churches. On the 22nd of June, King George conducted the official opening of Parliament at a ceremony in Belfast City Hall. The King, accompanied by Queen Mary, arrived in Belfast aboard a ship. They were processed by horse-drawn carriage up High Street, Castle Place and Donegal Place to the City Hall. Amid great security, there were very large cheering and flag-waving Unionist crowds. Uh, there on the screen, you will see uh, on the left-hand side a program, an official program for the uh, opening of Parliament. I might just add by way of a side comment that uh, a copy of this program was for sale recently on eBay. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to go up to the price they were asking for, £200. <laughs> but nonetheless, we have the cover of it here tonight. And beside it then, a wonderful photograph taken by Alex Hogg. This is the Royal Party processing up High Street. The Royal Party was received at the City Hall by Sir James Craig, members of the new Parliament and various Unionist dignitaries. Nationalists of Sinn Féin MPs did not attend. 
In the main debating chamber, the king made an impressive and impassioned speech. He began by recording his past visits and attachment to Ireland. He said, For all who love Ireland, as I do with all my heart, this is a profoundly moving occasion in Irish history. End of quote. He welcomed the new parliament. He said it is an important moment, not just for the six counties alone. He appealed for an end of strife and he called for a new era of peace. He urged people to forgive and forget. Uh, this event was well received in the Unionist press, as you can imagine, but not so in the Nationalist press. However, however, his reconciliatory speech turned out of important consequences. The speech triggered renewed efforts to find a way out of the ongoing conflict between the IRA and Crown forces. On the 11th of July, a truce was called between the British government and Sinn Féin. Negotiations which followed led by Michael Collins, resulted in the Anglo-Irish Treaty of December 1921, which established a new government in the 26 counties with a considerable part of self-government, but it was not a republic. The new state of Northern Ireland faced many challenges in its early years. The first was to establish a wholly new administration. Efforts were started in this way even when the Government of Ireland Act was underway, uh, and in 1921, uh, efforts were made to design a new government who would have six ministries, a civil service, and these uh, actions were taken to provide a, a new form of uh, administration for the new Northern Ireland government. The new state, however, also faced significant political problems. The new political settlement I've talked about for North and South was welcomed widely North and South. However, however, in both parts, it left significant minorities who were opposed to the new arrangements. Elsewhere in Europe at this time, other new states were formed, such as Czechoslovakia and Poland. They also had important minorities, arising from national, religious or language divisions. So we were not unique in this problem. Uh, in Northern Ireland, there was a significant Catholic minority who were mainly nationalist or republican in politics and who regarded themselves as being in a state which is not of their making nor enjoying their support. Their opposition to the new state was expressed in non-violent forms of protest such as boycotting the new parliament. More extreme nationalists, however, used physical force in the form of a major IRA offensive against Northern Ireland in the first six months of 1922. Some 300 persons died in these months. The new Irish state, called the Irish Free State, also had important minorities. They had two minorities. Those in the three Ulster border counties were aggrieved at finding themselves in the southern state. Those Protestants and Unionists in the three Ulster border counties were aggrieved at finding themselves in the new southern state. After the Anglo-Irish Treaty, however, their leaders declared their support for the new state. More important, however, was a second minority, and this emerged within Sinn Féin, who rejected the Anglo-Irish Treaty for not delivering a republic. This led to a civil war, 1922-3, with some 1,500 fatalities, which is actually much greater than the loss of life in Northern Ireland in 1922. So Northern Ireland was not unique in the problems it faced in these years. The Belfast and Dublin governments would take tough and similar actions to back the legitimacy of their respective states. In the end, however, in the end, both would survive. Let me make some brief concluding comments. This time saw the establishment of Northern Ireland. These years leading up to and after the establishment of Northern Ireland witnessed many deaths, reflecting the failure to achieve compromise on political issues. We should remember with sorrow all those who died. Other countries at this time, however, it can be noted, also experienced violence on a large, and on a larger scale. I've mentioned the Irish Free State and Civil War. In Finland, a civil war in 1918 led to 25,000 deaths 
Northern Ireland witnessed very little permanent displacement of population. This contrasts markedly with other countries which also experienced partition, and with those countries in Eastern Europe at the same time, Eastern and Central Europe, other states were set up. There was mass forced emigration uh, of population that did not happen here in Northern Ireland at this stage. Northern Ireland was not unique in the problems it faced, but it avoided the extremes found elsewhere. In the end, Northern Ireland survived. It has also survived the last hundred years. We can be proud of this. Other states established at this time, Czechoslovakia and Poland, collapsed only a few decades later due to deep divisions and external forces. Northern Ireland and the Irish Free State were rare examples of two which survived. Over the next 50 years, from 1921, both states experienced failures and successes. In the case of Northern Ireland, there was a failure to establish a system of government and society which included all communities. Unfortunately, the constitutional issue remained at the core of our politics. The main success, however, of Northern Ireland was in its economic and social policies. Every decade, the population increased. By 1971, the Northern Ireland population had increased by 22.2% compared to its 1926 figure. This is a considerable achievement uh, that so many people were able to stay here, make a home here, get jobs here. The population increases by 22%. Now, in the case of the Irish Free State Free Republic, there were also successes and failures. Its success was the establishment of a prominent place in the international stage uh, for the country. Its chief failure, however, lay in its economic and social policies, which led to substantial emigration, in contrast to what happened in the North. By 1971, after 50 years, the population of the Irish Republic had increased by a mere 2%, or some 6,000 only, compared with 1926. Since then, of course, there's been a great change in the South, uh, new social and economic policies have transformed the country and that population has now grown significantly. Finally, today we've arrived at the centenary of the foundation of Northern Ireland. We now have a chance to look again at the events of this time. We have the advantage of having achieved very largely, if not entirely, very largely an accommodation over our political divisions, thanks to the principle of consent. Hopefully, hopefully, we can recall this earlier period with both understanding and empathy. Thank you. Actually, it's actually very, you know, it's good to have it put in context. I would never have thought of uh, the establishment of other countries that no longer exist around the same time as Ireland and, and Northern Ireland. And uh, it's, just, it's, just, it's just actually something I'm going to go back and read a wee bit more about. But thank you for the context in, in, in which uh, you placed it. Uh, I'm going to ask a very, uh, I say a family friend, but uh, Johnny is going to come now and bring us our Bible reading and perhaps share a, a few thoughts as well with us. We don't have to tap our watches for you, Johnny, sure we don't? <laughs> You're okay, thank you. Um, the lesson is taken from Corinthians 2, chapter 5, verses 11 to 21. The Ministry of Reconciliation. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us, 
so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are, yeah, if we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Peter God. I've been asked to say a few words just about my family's involvement in the formation of the state in 1921. Uh, there's, there's no doubt the state was set up in a time of great turbulence and it was not seen as something really to celebrate at the time. It was a surprise, as Brian said, uh, unionists did not want home rule. Uh, Carson, the leader of the Ulster Unionists, wished to stay with the United Kingdom. So, in looking at the centenary of the province, I believe it's a time not only for commemoration and celebration, but also for giving thanks. Yeah. Uh, in particular, we must commemorate the people that died in the sectarian violence that took place in that year. As far as the family were concerned, um, as we've alluded to, uh, John Miller Andrews, my great-grandfather, was in the first cabinet of Northern Ireland as Minister of Labour. Um, but it just didn't come from nowhere. The Andrews family were involved in politics in Ireland right back to the 1870s. And they were members of the Liberal Party. And it was J.M. Andrews who followed this tradition of his father and his great-grandfather in this strong liberal tradition. His father Thomas and uncle William Drennan Andrews were grandsons of William Drennan, the famous United Irishman. It's often forgotten that's where this liberal feel came into the family. It's often forgotten William, William Drennan was a famous campaigner uh, in the lead up to the 1798 rebellion. And it was those United Irishmen that were mainly Presbyterians at the time uh, who were possibly mostly absorbed into the Church of Ireland Church and there was a bit of a, a blur between whether people were Presbyterian or Church of Ireland at the time um, because until emancipation Presbyterians weren't able to worship in their own churches. So there was this great liberal tradition in the family and it was William Drennan Andrews who first fought a by-election, famous by-election in 1872 against uh, Lord Castlereagh, the Conservative candidate, narrowly lost uh, but that set the tone for liberal politics within the family and his younger brother then went on to become leader of the Liberal Unionists and was the lead speaker at the 1892 convention uh, in, in Balmoral which led to the overthrow of the, the second Home Rule Bill. Uh, Thomas again was the lead speaker in the convention 20 years later in 1912 uh, campaigning against the third Home Rule Bill and in parallel with that it was great-grandfather J.M. Andrews, who began his career in politics in 1912, uh, and he was very involved in helping Carson with organising the government. He went on to be a delegate uh, and was associated with the uh, Irish Convention of 1917, which was the last attempt at creating an all-Ireland solution to avoid partition. Um, we mustn't get too political here, but 
that convention fell on the whole idea of fiscal responsibility. Who was going to take fiscal responsibility, i.e. raising taxes, and, um, and in the Unionist view that should have been retained in London, reserved in London. But that was rejected by the Sinn Féin delegation. So there was really no, as Brian said, option but partition after that. So that led to what really has become a fine example of a two-state solution, which, as you know, has been promulgated in, 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 in other areas of, of the world, and in particular in the Middle East, um, in Palestine. Um, so J.M. Andrews went on to be uh, in the first cabinet and was elected in the 1921 election uh, in North Down. He was, uh, it was a PR election, and he was the second unionist elected after Lord Craig Avon. Uh, and he served in cabinet, as you can see in the programme, until 1943, when he retired as prime minister. Um, I think we've, it's worth just looking at, you know, what he actually achieved. And you know, as a result of this centenary, I've been looking into this and learning a lot, um, having not known so much about it. But you know, as Brian said, we really were a fledgling state. No one predicted that we would even survive. The collapse was predicted, and, and for, for a few years after it, particularly from the south, uh, many people thought it would, it would collapse quite quickly. Um, but you know, the ethos was, as Craig Avon said, that you know, while we didn't really want home rule, the Government of Ireland Act was effectively the fourth home rule bill. And Cars, uh, Craig did say that uh, it was important that we had the freedom to manage our own affairs and protect our civil and religious liberties. And it was great-grandfather who, who famously said that the um, Government of Ireland Act was an earnest attempt to solve the Irish problem, which had haunted British governments for 30, 40 years. Um, so he, he, he was very involved, along with the other five members of the Cabinet, in setting up this new government against all odds um, was predicted not to survive. Um, quite quickly, nothing like focus to ensure survival, quite quickly uh, the government of Northern Ireland stabilised the security situation with, really within a year. Um, and by 1924 the boundary was secure. Um, the, the election of 1924 uh, ensured that um, there was a, a unanimous vote. Um, even nationalists were abstaining on, in border areas which basically confirmed the boundary. And then 1926, um, great-grandfather was very involved in, in the agreement on the Reinsurance Act, which underpinned our financial security uh, as equal partners within the United Kingdom. And that was further negotiated by 1938. Uh, he's often attributed as being the one that ensured uh, that, 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 that Northern Ireland had parity in terms of finances, which led to our involvement in the welfare state and benefits of the health service. Um, he went on to be Prime Minister on the death of Lord Craig Avon, and of course it's in that period I think that Northern Ireland earned great respect within the rest of the Kingdom for the contribution to the Second World War. Um, and there's no doubt that I think you could probably say that contribution in the war, in the war um, underpinned our security within the United Kingdom, which up until then had been in doubt. And it was a Labour government in 1949 that enshrined the principle of consent in response to the Fine Gael's government declaration of an Irish Republic. Um, so by 1949, a lot had been achieved. The state was secure, and I think that is something that we can commemorate. Um, but there was obviously unfinished business. Ireland was, was divided. And there, was, there is a nice family story that came down through the family that when uh, great-grandfather was at Chequers with, 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 with Churchill during the war, um, he was there for dinner. And David Lloyd George was there, who was the Prime Minister, who um, uh, was, was at the time of the Government of Ireland Act back in 1921. And it was Lloyd George that said that the partition of Ireland meant that it was unfinished business. And in my view, the Good Friday Agreement was the finishing of that business where consent was secured in both parts of the island. 
So that's really a run through the family's involvement in, in the history and it's, it's very good to have had the opportunity to, to revisit that history, which I didn't know much about. Um, so, you know, finally, as we're, we're, we're in church, um, I think it's important that we remember the, extent, the successes of those early years of the state and not forget the huge loss of life in the sectarian violence of 1921, where 500 lives were lost in Belfast and there were 10,000 refugees that left the province and went down to the Free State, mainly in Dublin. And there's some really harrowing stories of those refugees when they arrived in Dublin. Um, but let us also remember the victims of the recent troubles and conflict all over the world where there is division, and in particular in the Middle East, Afghanistan, China, Myanmar, and Ethiopia. Um, let's give thanks for the opportunity for peace in our land and pray for a peaceful future on this island. Thank you. Tony, thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. You know what, we probably should have had a series of speakers and, 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 and give you two gents probably the whole night to yourselves. It's been very interesting and, and fascinating and just a little snapshot. If, if you aren't racing away, I'm sure at the end of the service, if people have questions, we can do it outside, socially distant. Now, at this part, it actually talks about where we're going to affirm our faith and then there's a sermon, but there's not really a sermon. I just want to share a very, very short thought. It won't even be 10 minutes, Brian, so nobody needs to tap their watch. You know, my wife. <laughs> I thought you would get me dig at me up there, you know, 10 minutes. I didn't think I preached that long. But anyway, um, we're going to affirm our faith. I'm just going to ask you to remain seated as we do that. The words uh, will appear on the screen. So do you believe and trust in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe and trust in God the Son? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born under the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe and trust in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As I said, this is not a sermon, but just in summing up, because listening uh, to these two gentlemen has, has given us a sense of hope as we look forward to the future. And whilst uh, the past 100 years of our country have been difficult, there have been many years of peace that we forget about. There have been many accomplishments there have been many famous people who have left these shores and taken their skills worldwide. And it's something that we should be thankful for. And, and even as I read the collect at the very start of this service as we prayed for Stormont, I thought just when that collect was written, probably we were in a reasonably stable uh, time where Arling was first minister and then it all sort of went uh, belly up a wee bit and, and we're still sort of in that flux. But, but... We have a tremendous hope and as Christians it's important that we continue to pray for our country and indeed for our land not just north but for the south as I said the Church of Ireland it's called the Presbyterian Church of Ireland it's called the Methodist Church in Ireland the churches aren't split by a boundary but we are united by our faith under God and just one verse that I want to leave with you that that whole passage is actually quite familiar and, and, and the passage of scripture that Johnny read to us from Corinthians is called the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation is a word that we have become very familiar with. But verse 17, and, 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 and I leave this with you before we pray. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and give us the ministry of reconciliation. That ministry is not just for one or two people or the peacemakers, but it is for all of us. And we're going to pray, and I'm using a, a form of prayer uh, that has been set before us. 
uh, there will be just a, a little response from you. At the end of each prayer, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and hopefully you will confirm those prayers by saying, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, you promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear the prayers of those who ask in faith. We pray for your church in all the world, for its unity and mission. Lord, we pray especially for this diocese of Down and Jamor and for David, our bishop. Lord, we pray for all Christian leaders in this community around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that we may work for peace and embody Christ's ministry of reconciliation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those whose discipleship brings them into places of conflict and risk, and those whose help to demolish walls of mistrust and prejudice. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for all who stand alongside victims of hatred and sectarianism, that your church may work unceasingly for human rights, equality and justice in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, indeed, we do pray for our MLAs and members of the Northern Ireland Executive, especially at this time. Lord, we pray for leaders of this land, Lord, and indeed of all nations, north and south. We pray that they may be given the courage to choose good and reject evil in accordance with your will. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for all those who display courage in upholding justice and in preserving peace throughout the world. We pray for our fellow countrymen and women who work for the resolution of conflict in our society and beyond. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the sick, the suffering and the bereaved. Lord, we especially remember those among us and in our community who bear the physical and psychological scars of the past. Lord, we just pray for healing in their bodies and in their minds. Lord, in your mercy. And so, Almighty God, we long for the time when your kingdom shall come on earth. When people and nations shall acknowledge your sovereignty, seek your glory and serve your good and righteous will. Help us not only to pray but also to work for that new day and enable us by your grace to promote the cause of justice and peace, truth and freedom, both in our own society and in the light of the world. For the honour of Christ, our Saviour, our Lord. Amen. And we pray the beautiful words that our Saviour has taught us, our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. I just realized I forgot to slip in and Christ alone into the PowerPoint. Uh, just bear with me and I will actually find uh, that hymn uh, for you. Just chat amongst yourselves for a moment or pray for each other. It's been one of those days, Father's Day in our house and and uh, just, uh, yeah, just bear with me.
Hier staan. You get another sermon here by the look of it. We did have it two seconds ago. There we go. Amen. Let's sing together. Yes, okay. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, sworn by the ones he came to save, till on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No scheme of man can ever blot me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. You may be seated. We are just going to have just a couple of closing prayers and then we are bringing this service to a close uh, by singing uh, the first verse of the national anthem. And, and so we just want to continue in that attitude of prayer. The prayers should uh, appear on the screen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we mark the centenary of the opening of the Northern Ireland Parliament, Grant to us a true sense of what is to be your people in the world. We ask you to so guard and guide all who reflect on the past, all who lead us in the present, and all who shape our future, that we may model our society on the image of Christ and to his glory, in whom we trust and through whom we pray. Amen. And to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forever. Amen. And we stand together and invite you to join with us as we sing the first verse of the National Anthem. God save our gracious Queen, long live our noble Queen, God save the Queen, send her victorious, happy and glorious, long to reign over us, God save
So go forth into the world and peace be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honour everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen. I can I ask you just to be seated and then the wardens will guide you out. It's still dry outside. The weather forecast was wrong. And just uh, as I turn off the camera and uh, slip outside, then you can uh, exit as well behind me. But again, I want to thank really, really, from the bottom of my heart, the two gentlemen who spoke to us. It was really enlightening and just lovely to hear sometimes a personal story or two uh, from the past. Thank you.